thank you for joining today's Chief Data and Technology Officer Summit. I am Caitlin Halperty, Director of our IBM AI Accelerator and host of our Summit Series. Today, we've pulled together a panel of leading experts to share how they are meeting critical regulatory requirements and staying ahead of rapidly evolving AI regulations, all while delivering innovation and growth. Once again, we have an impressive cross-industry list of C-level executives across product, transformation, digital, and data. At the core of this conversation is trust. I hope you will walk away from today's discussion with tangible insights and new meaningful connections to add to your professional network as we strengthen the data and AI community. Our intent for today's session is to dive further into what it means to embed trust in key decision-making points along the AI lifecycle, empower our employees, and how we can accelerate transformation as leaders. In the spirit of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, I like to speak to tangible examples of how we are building trust in data and balancing regulation against innovation. One example of how we are empowering employees to play an active role in regulatory compliance is in our government-owned entity identification. This practice is critical to help ensure compliance with corruption-related laws around the world. Our company-wide Find GOE tool was developed out of our data office, and it enables employees to verify status early in the sales cycle and proceed accordingly. We have a deep partnership between our Chief Data and Privacy Office and a suite of capabilities within our global privacy framework that we will share more about throughout today's session as well. You've heard me speak about two initiatives I'm particularly passionate about, our personal information taxonomy, a curated and consolidated set of global privacy terms, as well as our client and product master data. Uh, this solution now consoli consolidates over 40 data sources across finance, sales, procurement, and other areas of the business, significantly improves data accuracy, and aids our sellers with critical access to competitor information. Uh, these are examples of capabilities we've developed to address our own compliance needs, help us to automate and focus on growth. Uh, it's an exciting time to be working in regulatory and privacy as solutions drive both efficiencies and top line growth. Please chat in your questions and feedback throughout today's session. Uh, we've got a great panel lined up and a great set of keynote speakers as well. Thank you for investing your time to join us today. Over to Dave Matheson, CEO of CDO Club, and see you at the live Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Caitlin, and welcome everyone to episode five of the IBM CDO CTO Summit on balancing innovation and growth with risk and regulation. I'm David Matheson, the CEO of the CDO Club and CDO Summit, and I'm thrilled to introduce our special guest today, Michelle Browdy, who's Senior VP Legal and Regulatory Affairs at IBM, and Interpol Bandari, the Global Chief Data Officer at IBM. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. What do you see as the main challenges companies face today when trying to balance innovation, risk, and regulation? Thanks, David. And uh, I want to thank both you and Interpol for including me in today's discussion. It's a very important topic for IBM as well as for our clients. And I think if you take a step back, this really all comes down to a discussion about trust. We live in an era where there's been an erosion of trust really across all kinds of different fronts, and certainly technology is among those. We have people who are relying on technology more and more, and at the same time, they're trusting it less and less. They're wondering who has access to my data, who's monetizing my data, who might be hacking my data or ransoming it. How biased are all these algorithms that are constantly telling me what to buy, where to go, what to do? And it's really not surprising against that backdrop, this really this basic loss of public trust that now you have regulators and legislators all around the world who are looking to take action. We probably saw the EU taking an early lead, not only with GDPR, but through the use of the competition authorities and enforcement actions. And now you see plenty of others in the US, Latin America, Asia, pretty much everywhere, anxious to participate as well. While a lot of the concerns probably arise initially in the consumer space, these laws and regulations are affecting enterprises as well, both large and small which may be a very long way of getting back to answer your initial question, which is if the fundamental concerns of both users and government regulations lies in trust, then the way you could both innovate and grow and at the same time be responsive to risk and regulation is to become a source of trusted technology. I know certainly at IBM, we've recognized the critical importance of trust in technology for a very long time. Why should clients trust us with their data and with their hardest problems? Fundamentally, we think of our value proposition as bringing trusted innovation 
to our clients and to the world. Trusses are licensed to operate and we know it. You need to recognize the importance of responsible stewardship, protecting our clients' data. We published our principles of trust and transparency years back and we find ourselves committed to privacy and security for clients' data. We have an, af uh, an active AI ethics review board and if we can focus on providing trusted technology and help our clients do so as well by building secure systems, protecting privacy, attacking bias in AI so people can make better use of data, then instead of a trade-off of innovation versus risk and regulation, you hopefully end up with a virtuous cycle that by innovating trust into your products, you can innovate and grow. Great that you mentioned trust, Michelle. Interpol, what's your take on new technologies, innovation, and trust? When you brought up this topic and said this is going to be the topic for our summit, you know, I suggested that we definitely invite Michelle because you would hear from somebody at the most senior level who is actually responsible for making sure and shepherding us through these new technologies and the innovation that uh, the company does. And I'd just like to pick up on what she said there. Trust is our license to operate. And if you go back and think about the longevity of the company, et cetera, that's you know, one of the core values that IBM is known for. And that has, I think it's essentially part and parcel of everything that we do. So in some sense, Thinking in terms of new technologies and uh, trust or innovation and trust, really two sides of the same coin. And also insofar as if you think in terms of aligning organizational values with societal values and societal impact, you've got to view it the same way. So when we think in terms of solving a problem like say around AI, right? We did Jeopardy in 2011, uh, but we're still working that problem really hard because We've come to understand that aside from the algorithms, you've got to also address things like fairness, robustness, transparency, et cetera. Otherwise it's really not going to be part and parcel of what an enterprise is going to do. So solving that entirety of the problem in a platform kind of way just makes it harder. It takes longer, but eventually it's not only the right thing to do, I believe it's the competitive thing to do because that's really what helps you stand out with the other offerings that are out there. You know, could you, while I've got you, Interpol, could you share your experience uh, handling the data privacy regulations within IBM? Yeah, that's another example, right? The, it goes back to that same concept of being two sides of the same coin uh, with regard to innovation and trust or regulation and innovation. The regulations also lead to innovation. And when EU GDPR, when that came about, uh, that was something that we had to respond to very, very quickly. We had maybe a year, year and a half to get everything uh, done. And the scale was tremendous, especially for a company like IBM with its global reach. You know, now, if you, even if you think in terms of our clients and, you know, our employees, that kind of numbers in, uh, number in the hundreds of thousands, but then there's also our suppliers tens of thousands, partners worldwide, you know, hundreds of thousands. And uh, the way EU GDPR was constructed, there was a framework. So if you were truly part of a supply chain like that, you know, you had to make sure that every link in the chain was robust. And so when, when we started looking at that problem, we realized very quickly that this has a complexity far beyond just the internal application. We also have to make sure that the suppliers we're working with, the partners we're working with, were also all adherent. And the complexity of that initially, you know, it was a very heavy lift, but then what it led to was some of these things that I just talked about, the principles of fairness, transparency, privacy, robustness, uh, that came from that experience and essentially found its way in some of our platform offerings that we take to our clients because we realize that this is not something that you're able to pull off easily in a manual context. So that was the innovation part of it. And that's something that as, and Michelle alluded to this, as the regulations move forward and there are more and more of these regulations that spring up, you know, the states have their own regulations and now different countries have their own regulation. The complexity of being able to do something like this in a world that is innovating at breakneck speed as well. I mean, I'll just give you a couple of examples on that. I think in the next 10 years or so, 
we will have quantum computing as kind of the, the new kid on the block, but it will touch every industry in about 10 years. And people don't realize how quickly that's moving. You know, that's a classic example of innovation. So as we move forward with this, the regulations will, will, will eventually catch up, but initially they will be running behind. And I think that's one you know, key aspect of this as you move forward that behooves us as a company to make sure that again, we're, we're looking at this from a much broader context of society, as well as obviously the context of technology. In that broader context, can you talk about responsible tech policies with governments around the world? Let's start by acknowledging that regulators are going to regulate. I mean, that's, that's what they do. You have hardworking people and governments all around the world who are committed to protect the public interest. So as long as you're continuing to have a lack of trust in technology, we're gonna see activity in this space as people try to protect the public interest. And you'd see as, as Interpol alluded uh, to, you've seen an enormous growth in the regulatory environment gro uh, globally over the last several years. Think about it. We probably started with privacy regulations, data localization, then uh, regulations around cloud, now you see cybersecurity and the executive orders in that uh, space, proposed AI or regulations, a revisitation of the antitrust laws. Uh, and all of these efforts are to try to drive, ideally, better behavior or better outcomes. So you have this growth in regulations, both really geographically as well as substantively. So against that backdrop, I would have you know, two simple uh, observations. First, I'd suggest there's a real benefit for tech companies to work with government and other stakeholders to participate in that regulatory process. How can we help regulators to better understand the underlying in, uh, issues and the impact of the potential regulations they're, they're gonna be drafting? Technology moves very fast and there's a real risk of inadvertently stifling innovation if regulations are dra uh, drafted without uh, uh, giving a, a thought to those other consequences. For example, we tend to support precision regulation. Think of, say, regulating toxic end use cases of technology rather than barring the underlying technology itself. You're trying to help ensure that, that uh, regulations can enable technolog uh, technological innovation to continue to progress. How can we provide expertise that our companies have? In addition, I think there are a lot of really critical issues we're looking at. You've mentioned some of them just now, cybersecurity, quantum, secure uh, uh, supply chains, blockchain, and the like, to name a few. They're of enormous importance for companies and governments alike. So how can government and the private sector work together to improve outcomes in a way that enables innovation while protecting the public good? There's a real opportunity here to participate in this process that shouldn't be ignored. So that's, again, the first observation. But the second piece, and maybe this comes back also to comments that Interpol made, is it recognizing that regulatory restrictions are real and growing? How can companies get ahead of the curve with innovation to build in security by design, privacy by design, attack bias in AI and the like? Do this naturally into our products. Think about how you create industry standards, technical measures and the like to improve that trust in technology. I'm certainly not gonna say we're gonna head off regulation, but we'll be more prepared when it eventually uh, comes which again, probably brings us full circle to the notion that innovation and compliance with regulation can work together. When we're out there trying to change the world with technology, we have an obligation to do so responsibly and as responsible stewards. So I think it's really incumbent on us to help to create an environment of trust so people can understand and harness that technology wisely. Thanks for both of you for sharing your wisdom today. And now let's explore this topic a little bit more deeply uh, with our panel. Thank you so much for that great session, Interpol and Michelle, and I'm thrilled to moderate today's panel and to introduce our guest speakers. John Nicastro, who's Senior VP for the Enterprise Data Office at SiriusXM. Laureen Knudsen, who's Chief Transformation Officer over at Broadcom. Satnam Singh, who's Chief Product Officer for Corporates, Trade and Tax at Thomson Reuters. Tom Eck, who's Senior VP of Digital Transformation from Pfizer. Thanks so much to you all for joining us today. Great to see everybody. We're going to start things off with a speed round. What percentage of your time does your data management team spend on innovation? And maybe the follow-up question to that is what percentage of the time are they spending on compliance? Let's start out with John. Yeah, thank you, Dave. I think um, 
given given the current landscape of where we are with data privacy today, um, we we are aiming for a balanced portfolio. I would tell you it's 50-50, but I would also tell you that um, I, I would propose an asterisk on the notion of innovation because I think there's quite a bit of innovation potential if we consider just the advances in machine learning in the data management space today. So I think from that perspective, innovation is not binary. Laureen? I'd say we're about, we're, we're probably close to 50-50, maybe at times 60-40, just to, to try and get some of that innovation in place, but always keeping in mind compliance. You don't want to lose your customer's IP. Tom? Well, maybe we're the laggard, but being in a you know highly regulated industry, we have been spending the majority of our time keeping our house in order with regards to regulations, compliance, data security. But as we start to kind of drain those items, we are turning our attention to innovation. And I think we'll be in a, a much different place this time next year. We've, we've brought a couple of uh, data products to market just now. They're being ve very well received. And I think we, we need to start kind of getting our muscle memory for, for being more innovative on, on data products. Uh, while still maintaining all of the, the guardrails for compliance. Gardner 2021 was saying only 22% of data management's team time is spent on innovation. As senior VP at the Enterprise Data Office, how is SiriusXM getting timely data to decision makers? At Sirius, we, we approached uh, our self-service enablement strategy with three guiding principles. Number one is we treat our assets as products. As an example of that, we take our products really through a product development lifecycle. It really starts by studying our internal consumers as a market. We, we design and build go-to-market strategies. We identify our internal consumers through persona development, since we have such a broad spectrum of skills skill sets from business analysts all the way through expert data scientists. So we looked at their customer journey, for example, how they onboard into tools, what channels we provide for them to explore, uh, discover, search, and leverage our assets. This year, we're launching SiriusXM Data University, which, which not only focuses on intrinsic skill training, uh, but we're curating content. So it's, you know, it's contextual to our specific data because we believe data understanding is a critical component of increasing speed to value. This customer centric approach really helps us orient uh, our data assets and analytic services to our internal culture. And the second principle to this is, is just a constant pursuit of removing gatekeepers that create bottlenecks to the data. And one of the items we're constantly focused on is how to mitigate risk without jeopardizing growth. A key objective here for us is security and privacy by design. And that really started with us implementing a catalog and classifying our data, embedding controls into the process and code so that we can default this as uh, core features in our data products and remove some of the red tape that tends to slow the process down. It also means that how we determine fit for use and our ability to limit certain data based on its intended purpose had to be embedded in the product itself so it's as seamless as possible. And today we're looking at things like adaptive policy-based controls which is very interesting. And we're looking very closely at evolving our current controls just to be more dynamic and agnostic to the consumer application so we can build this out at scale. And the third and last principle, which, which I think is, is foundational to, to get data democratized into the hands of the users is to unify the taxonomy. And we have many areas of our business doing analytic engineering, pulling all that tribal semantics and business logic out of the analytic tools and unifying our metrics across all the various dialects of our business is essentially a vision to create this unified semantic layer and enable a, a bring your own analytic tool environment. While at the same time, we can realize safe and efficient reuse of data so that we can increase our collective speed to insight. Uh, over to Laureen, can you provide any examples of companies that you believe have a good balance? Absolutely, yeah. I work with a lot of the largest companies in the world right now, as well as customers of Broadcom. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are struggling to balance this correctly. And I recently heard an interview with Elon Musk on SpaceX, and I think they're one of the best companies for balancing risk with reward. They constantly talk about when they blow up a rocket, they get the most data out of it. We've all heard about when he put people in the, in, into space, right, that they had pictures of the dads all over their office so that you understood the, the damage you could do if you didn't do your compliance correctly. And he was talking about how they were working on a door for the new spaceship, and he ended up uh, removing that process right now because they just are trying to get it up in the air, the right. big Starship rocket. And so removing the door, they didn't need a door right now. And so they, they could blow up things for far cheaper if they didn't have a door in it, and they could still get the same data that they needed to advance. Disney is another one that really balances data 
as well as innovation. And then you look at where they use data and where they don't, right? Magic bands are in Florida. Magic bands are not in California because they couldn't secure the data with so much um, development right around the parks. We heard um, John talking about building in the processes to secure that from the beginning. You can't build in quality at the end or security at the end. You've got to build in security from the start. I was at a huge company that almost every financial institution uses their products previously, and we had to build security in from the very beginning. And it's wrapping that process in as you're going along to make sure that you're fundamentally building in security, but allowing data access as much as possible. Over to sure. Sudnam, as Chief Product Officer for Corporate Tax and Trade at Thomson Reuters, you're in a regulated industry, it must be a real challenge in bringing out new products in an environment with ever-changing regulations. How do these external and internal compliance issues affect your decision-making when you're delivering new products and services? Absolutely, Dave. Um, a key aspect of our products is to actually to help our customers stay compliant with tax and trade regulations. You know, this spans across changes in, in tax requirements in the jurisdictions in which our, you know, our customers operate, but also how the taxes are reported and recognized by local governments. And the trend that's happening is governments around the world are making changes with a view to streamlining tax reporting and compliance. Uh, in addition, we're also seeing uh, an expanding tax base as governments look to cover the budget shortfalls. We did a survey uh, recently and uh, based on the review of the tax rate and changes to the content that we have on the Thomson Rogers one source platform. We've observed that in the first seven months of this year, in 2021, you know, state and local governments have added rates at the city and district level that match the total number of additions for all of 2020. And you look at Europe and take the example of VAT uh, reporting in Europe. You know, traditionally what would happen is businesses would file the returns and related documentation at certain intervals after the, the business transaction had taken place. With digital invoicing or what we call e-invoicing, businesses now must register the invoice in a predetermined format through a clearance platform that's provided by the country or state as a precondition for the invoice to be recognized for bad purposes. So this, this digital invoicing is, is taking shape across Europe. Uh, 2019, Italy became the first EU country to introduce mandatory invoicing for B2B transactions. You have Poland and France that have a specific PEPL format for submission of the invoices. And we track these regulatory changes Quantify the changes in our software to help customers navigate and stay compliant without impacting their business operation. For our customers, operating successfully in this environment requires adoption of technology, adoption of processes to, for real-time tax determination and compliance. And this is not a small feat for large corporate tax departments, which are, you know, have a strain of weight, if you will, increased demand resource constraints but has a bigger impact, if you will, on small and mid-sized businesses, especially with e-commerce. You know, these small and mid-sized businesses can sell to a larger customer base than ever, but they need to be set up for automated and accurate tax collection and compliance. So as we look at all of our, we track, you know, several hundred thousands of these regulatory developments across the globe, look at how we need to integrate these changes in our product, build a lot of, you know, uh, processes around it to make sure our customers remain compliant. But then we also develop new products and services, uh, especially like in the areas of workflow and other, so that our customers can get continuous efficiency and insights into their tax obligations and compliance. It's a great space to be. It's helping these companies not only stay compliant, but become more efficient. Taking out all the friction, Tom, as Senior VP of Digital Transformation at Fiserv, what are some keys to good data governance models that can still allow you to have the flexibility to drive new products and business growth? I want to go back to one of the things that Laureen said, where um, you can't build security and quality in at the, at the end. And I think that there's a couple of cautionary tales that have unfolded recently with some of the fintech unicorns who kind of failed to think of these things up front established a client base and then learned that they were in they were in hot water with the, with the regulators over a few different things. So if you don't think about these things going in, they're awfully hard to, hard to bolt on. So that, that being said, the first thing that I like to think about is what is our operational model when it comes to governance? Are we going to be fully centralized, central dictate, fully distributed, aka anarchy, or, or a federated model? And we're landing on the federated model where 
kind of the decisions over the key, you know, concepts like, you know, country specific regs, et cetera, are centralized and more or less dictated to the business units. But we let the business units have some flexibility in how they want to implement these, these rules to fit their specific goals. I'm also very, uh, come from an entrepreneur background and I'm very pragmatic and still, still hands-on with the technology. So there's a tension here because, you know, I believe in like just enough management and just enough governance, enough to keep us out of trouble, but without um, slowing the pace of innovation and product uh, development, that's a that's a, just an ongoing kind of and en typical engineering kind of trade off that you gotta you gotta kind of get right. And like I said in a couple of my answers previously, we're still kind of indexed a little bit more on the conservative side just because of of, of what we do and you know we process sure. trillions of dollars of people's money every year. And then once we kind of have these models, which you know let's say they start out as paper documents. If they're just stay on paper, um, very difficult to, to enforce, audit, you know, what kind of dashboard do you have to know how well you're doing? You certainly don't want to have the regulators give you the score, right? So you want to know ahead of time. So I think about how do we then implement and enforce and then and then report on the adherence to, to data governance model. You know, really as a technologist, I'm focused on how we can codify these policies and enforce and audit them using um, technology and automation. Um, and just, just as an example, so we're creating a, a, temp, uh, um, a library of reusable templates for our product development teams to use as really as accelerators. So they don't have to think about all these things and they can stay out of, they could stay out of the hot water. And we are already seeing the, the, the fruits of those. We're, all, we're, early, we're early stages on it, but we're already seeing acceleration of, of time to market and also kind of a general sense of relief actually from the app teams that say, okay, look, I trust that the guardrails are in place, the appropriate SMEs, CROs, et cetera, have thought these things through. Um, the appropriate teams have implemented them in, in code and in automation and in other types of monitoring. And we can just go ahead and build our apps. And then I'll, I'll just say one last quick thing, going back to kind of uh, one of my, my former um, alma maters at IBM. Um, one of the things I worked on there was the IBM Cloud for Financial Services where this was exactly, and this was done in conjunction with Bank of America, and now it's growing. Um, but that was also the idea, is how do we take right. compliance and regulation and put it into kind of the fabric of, of the cloud? So everybody doesn't have to worry about this on their own. Thank you for doing that, Tom. We had Chris Wright of Red Hat, you know, IBM bought Red Hat, hybrid, hybrid multi-cloud solution is such a benefit because now you can have the code meeting the developers in a shared remote workspace with the governance guardrails up yeah. there at the same time, comparing data ops to DevOps. We have systems in place for developing software, application suites, et cetera. We're seeing the same thing develop in data ops. We're building out new applications all you know, in the hybrid cloud environments. Thanks, Tom. I think we've covered governance and regulation and risk pretty well. Right, let's look at innovation and growth. John, before Sirius XM, I mean, you were at CA Technologies and Cable Vision and Deutsche Bank and, and Citi. And so you've probably seen a number of good examples of innovation programs. Could you give us some examples of successful innovation programs that you believe have companies that have created a culture of innovation and how did they do that? What, what are they doing that innovation laggards are not, John? Great question. Uh, you know, I, I think it's super important to foster innovation through programs like a corporate incubator. The companies who are leading in innovation have robust incubation processes in place with lean startup methodologies, and, and they're very efficient at collecting and harnessing and leveraging ideas that create value for their business. So as an example, at CA Technologies, we had what we call the CA Accelerator, which fostered startups within the company and helped them get internal funding and traction. And it gave employees this risk-free entrepreneurial experience and a chance to create new revenue streams for the company. In a similar fashion at SiriusXM, we have a very similar enterprise incubation process called the Ideas Lab to ensure that uh, you know, we have a seamless way cross-functionally to bring employee ideas to life and give everyone across the company an opportunity to contribute to that pipeline. We take a lot of pride in fostering innovation. It, it, it's happened for a, a long time at SiriusXM and we just recently launched our most advanced satellite uh, in partnership with SpaceX. We have a next-gen platform in the vehicle called 360L, which leverages the connected vehicle ecosystem in partnership with all our OEMs. And we've been leaders in music curation science for quite some time, right? So you can really feel and see that 
innovative passion in our employees. And it's one of the things I enjoy most about uh, working at SiriusXM. What is the HR department's role in making sure that employees are incented in alignment with business growth? Primarily, you know, in the past, we used to incent the business on certain goals and then incent the technology teams on something else. So technology was often measured on quality um, and business to getting features out to market. So there was this tension that was supposed to help us be better all the way around, but really generally one department or the other has more power within the organization and they win. So either you end up putting out a bunch of low quality code or you, um, you know, end up having high quality code, but not getting as much out, not having innovation. And another thing that's really worked against innovation lately is speed. People keep trying to speed up their engineering teams without speeding up the rest of the organization. And so really HR's part is in aligning those incentive programs that they have, right? With not allowing the the business side of the organization to have bonus structures and incentives that don't tie into customer value. Everybody needs to be tying into customer value to get the right innovation and to get the right quality levels out the door. Your customer doesn't find value if you lose their data. Your customer also doesn't find value if you're not innovating. So there's that happy medium between new features and new technologies and and keeping things very secure and, and in the right place. And really HR needs to fundamentally change the way that they look at how they incent everybody in the organization in order to get the right balance there. And without that, it's really difficult because it doesn't matter how, what you do within technology organizations, what you do on the business side, what great ideas you come up with. If people at the end of the day don't get rewarded for that behavior, yeah. they slip back into into bad patterns. Sudnam, you've also worked in data and tech and product roles at Oracle, MetLife, Microsoft, uh, Travelocity, Omnicom. Did those organizations have a culture of innovation? TR, Thomson Reuters, is, is, is big on innovation. There's a lot of culture about what fundamentally we think about is a culture of customer centricity. And this is a broader aspect, right, which is anytime you have a culture of innovation, it has to start there about, you know, successful product companies immerse themselves completely into the workflow of their customers. You know, you painstakingly understand even the minute details of the activities that your users and customers do every day. You know, personally, I have this five point framework about, you know, asking and understanding answers to key questions. Like the first one being, you know, what are the daily activities that my customers and users are engaged in today? I mean, you take the example of advertising industry, right? Marketing optimization and automation actually came from the need to move quickly within the context of digital advertising. You had channel managers who were spending significant amount of time reviewing data points such as how much am I spending, what are the views, what are the clicks across multiple properties, across multiple creatives. And then you had optimization and real-time bidding really coming in and offering a solution to drive efficiency. So that's the first one, daily activities that your users and customers are engaged in. The second one is, you need to understand this, not only in the context of your product ecosystem, but what are the upstream and downstream activities that your, that your users and customers are engaged in? What did they need to do before they started using your product and services? And what do they need to do after they've used their product and services? And when you look at the travel industry, especially for leisure travel, it isn't just about booking a hotel room or a place to stay. It's also about what you plan to do when you arrive at your destination. And that's when you look at companies like Airbnb and the focus on discovery of things to do or, or what they call experiences that make your vacation so much better. The third piece is how do you create efficiencies in the process that the, your customers or users need to follow? You know, you improve their cost of operations, you know, improving the bottom line, or you drive additional insights that helps them uncover accretive revenue or margin opportunities. I mean, you look at the robotic process, you know, automation and industry that can, came as a need, if you will, to drive workflow automation for corporate processes. When you look at number four, which is how do you improve the experience of your customers and users engaging with the product so they like engaging with the product or they, it's easier for them to engage with the product to do what they need to do. I mean, you look at Apple as an example here. You have this famous story about Steve Jobs fretting about the clicking sound that when the headphones were going to be inserted into the phone. I mean, that's truly a thought process around, you know, how do I, you know, think very detailed about the experience that my customers have. And then finally, one thing I would say, I know we were talking about, you know, failing fast or, or whether the idea not being to fail. Um, I'd say we evolved from this notion of failing fast to learning fast, right? Creating a bias for action 
learning fast and being agile, right? To what Lorraine was sharing earlier about SpaceX, it's about getting in, out in the market and learning. You know, you achieve that by also bringing product, technology, and design early into the customer discovery process. So, you know, these are several of the items that we're, you know, working on at Thomson Routers, really bringing the teams together, focusing very heavily into what our customers uh, need to do and have to do in order to maintain the regulatory compliance and the activities that they need to do in support of that. So thank you so much, Satnam. Tom, it's pretty clear today that harmonizing innovation with governance is possible, uh, but I'm wondering, you know, what other tools or platforms or methodologies do you believe will support faster decision-making with high quality data? Any thoughts there, Tom? I'm a huge proponent of platforms and for, for several reasons, but most germane to this conversation, again, is imbuing those platforms with the guardrails all the way at that level of the stack. Not only does it accelerate um, product development, but it gives, let's take the auditors, it gives them a single consistent pane of glass that they can look across the entire portfolio and they're not digging into various systems. So it just makes life a lot easier um, on, on those terms. I, I also think that um, a lot of the tools you mentioned, I would kind of collectively refer to as like agile cloud native development. So everything that's come, come online over the last 10, 15 years is very well proven, especially with fintechs and other, and other startups, this works. And it really takes a mindset change. It's not just a technology change. And it means being able to fail. And um, when that does happen, as long as you, you inspect how that missile blew apart into a trillion pieces and understand what happened you learned from it that that's not that's not a failure necessarily so you know base stuff at the platform level but then as we start thinking about architectures and then designs and then actually coding applications you know again we put lots of other guardrails in place at the, those levels so for example any net new development we are doing completely cloud native and we are somewhat of a legacy company but we are changing that and we're moving um, rapidly and aggressively to the cloud and you know, that's largely based on containers and containerized technologies. So what we're doing is all containerized apps must use a prescribed set of containers that we call them base containers that already have in them all of the, um, the security um, artifacts and, and the other, other policies that we can implement in code, they're already in there. And then on top of that, we have Geez, I don't know, you know, in our continuous integration, our CI pipelines, before you can commit code, it's all your code gets run through a zillion different types of tests, um, everything from kind of the typical set of vulnerabilities. And just to make sure that the code is adhering to our practice, such as, you know, you can't log um, PII or PCI data in any kind of diagnostic logs. They have to be masked or encrypted and that kind of thing. And it's a little, a little bit of this automation goes goes a super long way. The final thing I want to I want to leave with is it's really interesting how how this is it's taken on even new importance. So, being kind of you know the legacy with the fintechs nipping at our heels, we have to innovate in order to um, to survive, right? But I'm now starting to see written into SOWs from our clients that they want to have a monetary a substantial monetary penalty if our organization is not entirely agile. So just, just think about that. Now, now they're putting this into economic terms that you need to be agile, you need to move to the cloud. So all that pressure is on us. And if, if we don't have the basis of good governance around our policies, faster you go, the more glass you, you tend to break. So let's put these guardrails in place up front, and then we could move with the pace that, that we need to without getting into trouble. Tom, thank you. So the final question is what new data or analytics technology have you, have you been using over the last 18 months that you didn't use before that's resulted in improvements of delivery of new product while balancing the compliance and regulatory requirements? Uh, thanks, Dave. So, you know, we had a great conversation with Inderpal the other day about this. Machine learning and augmented intelligence just continue to see rapid growth across our ecosystem. There's just so many use cases emerging across all our business. So from a compliance perspective, I think it's important to think about MLOps, transparency, and ethical AI as just core foundational areas that we'll continue to invest in. And I'll, I'll also add one more graph technology, which uh, just has been extremely helpful in finding relationships and data and contextualizing so many diverse data sets. Again, trying to understand consumer behavior shifts over the last 18 months. 
uh, which has really caused uh, a lot of change. And it also invokes the need to look at your, your machine learning models and look at things like drift and change because of those behavior shifts. So I think as we look to evolve graph techniques at scale, we'll, we'll most likely see this technology form one of the foundations of modern data and analytics. So. Great, John, thank you. And Lorraine? Really, it's not new, a lot of new tools on the market. It's the, the way that we're using them, tying together that data so that you can have machine learning that makes sense. And a big focus for us is rooting out the bias in that yeah. that's inherent generally in the way that we look at data and what that means to the different types of population across the globe. So that's a new kind of slant on looking at the, the data and the tools that we're using. Got it. Satnam, your thoughts? Yeah, I would, I would agree with Laureen. It's, a, it's about the evolution of the AI and machine learning tools, right? So, and especially also in the area of really connecting the dots together across multiple different analytics that, you know, data that you're gathering within an organization. So you have data coming in from your product experience that your customers are using, your data coming in from your support teams, your data coming in from your sales teams, you have data coming in from your, from your operations teams. And how do you really start connecting the data more and more to truly understand how you can serve your customers better? And then the second area is also, you know, we look at AI and machine learning within the opportunity, you know, for the opportunity of looking at the regulatory changes that are happening and how do we translate them quickly, you know, even faster, if you will, into codifying them into the software products that we have. Thanks, Sidnam. And Tom, any tools that you weren't using 18 months ago that have now resulted in speed to delivery of new products? From the ML side of things, again, I'm, I'm not a paid representative of IBM anymore, but I will say that they have an excellent suite of, I would say it's kind of these, it, it's ML ops, but it's some of these areas that are not the most sexy, such as, you know, detecting bias in the data, uh, monitoring model drift, and even maybe more importantly, is um, model understanding. So when a neural network spits out, this is a fraudulent transaction, how do we know that it arrived at that decision? It's, that's a very difficult unsolved problem. The solutions I've seen to date are coming from academia are, are, are not there yet. So that's, a, that's something to watch out for. But I would say the product that kind of got us uh, excited is Snowflake, which is really kind of a data as a service platform. And somewhat paradoxically, we're getting better visibility on how our data governance is flowing and the controls that are in place. We're getting better visibility because I think that those were built into the product as first class citizens rather than, you know, kind of more of a legacy type of database platform that is having to adapt. This was kind of built into the beginning and we're having some really good success with that to the extent that we brought a couple of products to market already in this time that are based on, on Snowflake. That's great, Tom. And, and you know, back to IBM, I have to say, I mentioned before, but that acquisition of Red Hat's looking smarter and smarter, yeah. you know, get that hybrid cloud going so that you can have data ops drive business value and drive business velocity. Apparently building a governance model with real guardrails that doesn't sacrifice the speed of innovation isn't a pipe dream. What a great session. Thanks so much, everybody. And now, Let's move on to the live Q&A. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, great, great session. Really appreciate all the comments in chat. Thanks to everybody. I see Eileen Vadreen, uh, Chief Data Officer for the US Department of the Air Force on there and some old friends. I also wanted to thank uh, Larry Schiller, Richard Encero, Robert Abadi, and, and Lee Huang uh, for uh, posing some questions in chat as well. Really appreciate that. And Tom, thanks for doing double duty by answering questions in chat. I, I do appreciate that. Good to see you all. Uh, you know, we're going to take some questions from the audience now. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to them all. And I think maybe, Tom, since we've got you uh, right here, Let's kick off with a question from, uh, we've got one from Jay Franklin, who's VP of Enterprise Data and Analytics at First Tech Federal Credit Union. Uh, Jay asks, how are financial institutions applying the concept of balancing risk versus innovation regarding model risk management, Tom? Yeah, this is, um, we're at a very interesting time right now with, um, I think the biggest impact is going to be AI, okay? And I think it's both, um, I think it's both a boon and I think it also comes with a lot of concerns. And so I think as we move away from analytic models and maybe more statistically driven models to deep learning models, what's my concern is that they're just still not understood. There's still, um, there's still a sense of there's magic going on inside. 
And that's a very difficult thing to deal with when um, you, know, you, you have to make a risk decision based on a black box. So I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more adoption of, of, of AI and especially deep learning in, in our risk models. But my concern is that the understanding of those models and, and um, detecting and, and avoiding bias, are we're, we're not there yet. So it's a very open field um, for, for improvement. Um, and that's something that I think is gonna explode in the next five years. And again, not a paid representative of IBM, but they're at the forefront of a lot of really good tools to, to deal with these concerns. Absolutely, thank you, Tom. And by the way, others feel free to join in if you, if you wanna comment on these questions. We had a question for Laureen because we were talking about incentive uh, programs and, and the role HR plays. Here's a question from Luke Seegers. He's the founder at Subsalt, great product, uh, who asks about tips for changing internal company culture to adapt to the opportunity slash risks trade-offs for access versus privacy. Laureen. Culture is always one of the hardest things to change, right? In that mindset. And it's... um you know, really you have to start with a place of trust, you know, and, and changing culture requires the, the every employee to trust you, um, primarily every employee to trust you in order to start making some of those risky trade-offs. And so a lot of it is education initially, especially to management or people who um, react when a risk comes to reality. Um, and then getting the, the fundamental changes in place so that you can start changing the culture. Culture is going to be the last thing that changes primarily within organizations. Um, you know, and so it's model the behavior you want to see and do a lot of education for your leadership and your manager teams on, on how to respond when uh, certain things happen. Absolutely. Thank you, Laureen. And Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. I know how busy you are keeping keep in, in sync with all these regulations, a full-time job. And we've got, we've got a great question for you. Everybody wants to know what's coming up with AI regulations, right? So we got a great one from uh, Giorgio Sfredellos. He's ex-CEO at GF Accord, and, and he requested an update on AI regulations. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing out there, Michelle? Sure, thanks. Uh, uh, good question. I'll just give, uh, just a, try to give a brief response. Uh, remember, we talked uh, earlier about the growth in regulations, both geographically and substantively. And I think AI, I'd start out saying it's a, a, a substantive expansion, right? You probably saw privacy first. Now you're probably thinking about a continuum, privacy, cyber, data, AI. How do you take all those into account? And when you think then about growth geographically, probably not surprising to think EU is gonna be in the lead again. And I think probably the most significant recent uh, announce was earlier this year, the EU announced uh, an AI act. Now, I don't think it'll be final till uh, we get into uh, late 22, but it's proposed comprehensive regulation that'll take a risk-based approach to AI, banning some unacceptable uses and proposing extensive uh, regulation of what they'd call high-risk uh, uh, uses. So again, as we kind of talked about before, nice to see focusing on the use rather than the technology itself. So hopefully you're not gonna stifle innovation, but you're driving behavior to use it responsibly. Um, so again, EU probably in the lead, uh, people may have seen proposed legislation in Brazil. Uh, the Biden administration has talked about a proposed AI Bill of Rights that'd be headed up by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And we're seeing green shoots in Asia in this area as well. So again, think about uh, lining up AI, uh, privacy data, uh, cyber, all as, as areas that are going to need to be attended to. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that update. And uh, congratulations uh, in, internally at, at IBM. I know you've all been doing a lot of work to prepare for this. And we appreciate you being so transparent and sharing your learnings with, uh, with the outside community. So thank you so much. And John, great to see you. I know, John, you had talked about innovation. I think it was it at, uh, was it at CA Lab, uh, CA Tech? Uh, or maybe cable vision, but uh, we have a question here for you on the importance of establishing innovation labs. Uh, so it's somewhat related question. Uh, is it really a balance or can risk and regulation just be built into the engineering development process, John? Yeah, that's a great question. I think Michelle um, just, just very elegantly touched on it. I mean, I, I think over the last decade, we've learned a great deal from software and system engineering. And if it's one of those things that those verticals have taught us is that 
there's always an equation that requires a balance between performance, cost, agility, and efficiency. And all of that has to be weighed against the level of risk you're willing to tolerate. So I think approaches like privacy by design, whereby privacy is embedded into the design of a system or disciplines like uh, privacy engineering, right? Which, which is becoming uh, more and more relevant now, which is focused on code, the tools, the techniques to ensure these systems provide acceptable levels of privacy. I think these are the things that are really the path towards how we achieve that balance without stifling innovation like Michelle mentioned. And I think now more than ever, where consumer awareness of their data is greater than ever, you have to consider both the perspective of the end user and the functionality of the product or the service that you're developing. So, you know, I'll stick to my guns on that one. I think, I think there's always a balance that we have to strike. For sure. And back to Michelle's question, we got a question for Interpol, but um, you know, the, the question on AI, Interpol's always been very transparent about, you know, the, the importance of explainability, especially to the auditors, the regulators, and especially in the regulated industries. We got a question uh, for Interpol from, Howard Gregory. Howard is the head of global security business insights and analytics at Facebook. And Gre uh, Howard asks, across a company, organizations often define, understand, and mitigate risk in different ways. From your perspective, Interpol, what's the role that a data slash analytics function plays in building risk unity within an enterprise? And thank you for question, Howard. Yeah, risk unity. I like that term. I think that's, uh, you know, I mean, if you, allow the different areas to define and implement uh, the risk mitigation as they please, that is a recipe for disaster. So, um, and I'll just use a couple of examples that have, have already been mentioned. Uh, the GOE example, the government owned entity, you know, it's, it's for a global organization, extremely important because if you are dealing with a government owned entity, there are additional regulations and laws that apply and they differ country by country. And so it's extremely important to identify all that correctly. Now just think of an organization, right? From a legal department, the tendency is going to be to take a very, very conservative view as to what is a government owned entity. In the sales area, it'll be the opposite. It'll be about, let's take the, the loosest view possible for you know, what is a government owned entity. So who brings it all together? I mean, that's in, in a sense, the role of the data and analytic organization to make sure that the taxonomy, the, you know, the, the essentially the methodology by which this is uh, pushed forward needs to come together. And they, they have an extremely important pivotal role to play in being able to do that. Uh, another example, uh, you know, the EU GDPR, where actually the definition, the risk is, quantified, but to be able to mitigate it, you have to go not only uh, you know, within all your areas, but you got to go beyond. You got to go with the suppliers and the partners and make sure that everybody is adherent and compliant. So that risk unity aspect is a huge part of what you need to do. And part of it is you know, the taxonomy aspect. I think the data organization uh, is particularly suited to get into, but also uh, in terms of measuring compliance, putting forward uh, regular reporting that shows how far off certain areas are. You know, we've used that to great effect as a cudgel internally as well as externally to bring people in line as to what needs to be done. So you know, sh th there's obviously a lot of complexity around here because there's also the partnership aspect with the CISO and the chief privacy officer and so forth and the cultural aspects that go with this, but in a, in a nutshell, a huge role played by the data and analytics organization in partnership with the others to move this thing forward. Absolutely, and hey, we got time for another question. If anyone, wanna, anyone wants to tackle this, maybe we'll aim it at Interpol first if others want to jump in. We got a question from Mark Uk Sussman. He's director at Object Edge, and he's looking for a good example of data governance framework. Uh, Interpol, do you want to touch on that or anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, I can touch on it, but I'll just keep it uh, really brief. I mean, I'll, I end up, I'm keying off some of the comments in the chat as well. So yeah. in a data governance framework, right, a really good example is you want to make sure that you are working the metadata. So whatever framework you put together, essentially metadata, 
you know, is that, that's a trend that's going to, that's here for the long term. In fact, I'll go as far to say it's going to be driving the automation around governance. It's so that makes it much, much more robust than all the manual processes that people have to go through, which is also more expensive, but usually it's, you can't even do it because it, it just overwhelms you. So a focus on metadata is kind of a really big one when it comes to a data governance framework. Yeah. Tom, any thoughts on that? Any ideas on a good, a good data governance framework? Well, I think the key, the key term there is framework. And I go back to, you know, being a platform guy and, and really, um, really a platform is a, a mostly seen as a technical framework, but, you know, again, going back to my comment about the IBM cloud for financial services, I think that we're starting to see opportunities for merging, um, you know, policy kind of frameworks and technology frameworks. And I look, I look forward to, you know, codifying as, as, as much as possible so that it's not open to interpretation, but let the machines execute what the policies are that have been coded. Fantastic. Hey, I'm going to shift gears just a second. I wonder if anybody wanted to jump in on this. We had Richard Incero ask a question in the q and I'm wondering too, he's asking what are firms doing to measure trust? Is this measurable? Uh, does anybody want to jump in on that or uh, reply? It's kind of hard to measure trust. I mean, I think- yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I know uh, there's there's engagement survey questions, right? That often have to do with trust. But again, if your employees don't trust you, they often don't tell you the truth. Yeah. So, um, right? So you've, you've kind of got to catch 22. You know if your employees trust you though, right? And I mean, you just, you know, that's a tough one. It's a tough one to change if you don't have it. And keep, and quite frankly, it's a tough one to change and keep the same leaders in place. You yeah. know, you've got to, oftentimes there's, there's a reason people don't trust the organization, um, you know, and you, you've got to make some fundamental changes in order to make that happen. You can change behavior. It's going to take longer. Um, you know, new people, people are willing to give them an opportunity to be trustworthy and to be somebody that they trust. So, right. It's, it's all depending on the company and, and what's best for you, but um, right. I, you know, I, love, I love what Laureen said. I'll, I'll jump in on this one too. And, and I'll tell you, we, you know, a lot, a lot of times it's almost like pulling out these tricks up our sleeves that we've had as tools uh, for a long, long time. And, you know, we developed the concept of a trust score, right? Um, which really, it, it lies in the root of within our data catalog, it, it lies in the root of data quality and all of the intrinsic and contextual dimensions that we apply to our data. And we just rebranded a lot of that, right? Uh, to us, it's like, oh, this is old school data quality, but you know, we branded it uh, as a go-to-market strategy to develop this trust score that we would put out there and open up new doors of the possibility of, hey, um, you know, is this data uh, trustworthy and, and can we start leveraging and using it as a fit for use? And so I think there's a lot to be said about um, tried and true techniques and tools that we've been using for many, many years, right? That um, we can sort of rebrand uh, in a way that's fresh and, and you know, uh, conveys the trust that our users want and need. Fantastic. Yeah, Richard looks like he answered his own question in chat. He said, it sounds like a market opportunity, right? The data trust index, and you're already doing it at Siri, except that and John. So kudos to you and the team. Well, that was a great session, everybody. Boy, I, I feel a lot smarter today. I want to thank everyone and especially to the, to the audience for those great questions. And I want to hand it back over to Caitlin to wrap things up. Fantastic. Thank you, Dave. Thank you all for joining. Um, as Dave suggested, highly recommend checking out the chat. There's been a lot of great questions, great comments. We will distribute that after our intent with the series is always to collectively raise the, um, the, the, the level of expertise of the group. And we've just had fantastic speakers today. So Laureen, John, Tom, thank you so much for investing your time. It's been fantastic. Saying to Satnam, um, thank you very much, Michelle and Interpol for joining us. Our next session in the series will close out the year December 8th. So we'll have our year-end recap finale, um, also give our awards for the year. So please uh, join us there. That will be our, uh, our final one for the year, but this has been fantastic. So thank you all so much for, for joining us. We will um, distribute some follow-on materials that capture a lot of these key themes and look forward to uh, seeing you on our online community. Thank you all very much. <laughs>